I'm Deidre Willard here today with James Key. Uh, he's known internationally as a business and social change agent. He's had an incredible career, including serving as the chief executive officer of two amazing companies, Blockbuster and 7-Eleven. Uh, creating a he's also created a strategic consumer product collaboration with Walmart. His new book, Education is Freedom. It's a really comprehensive look at the way education changes lives. Hello, good to meet you. Hi, Deidre. Great to be back on Motley Fool. Yeah. Well, Jim, you have had this really varied career. It's led you through top organizations, very important positions. How has education been a through line for you? It was by far the most important enabler for me. And, you know, interestingly, uh, I grew up first generation to attend college. None of my family, brothers, sisters, father, mother. So I had no idea. I was a very typical young person uh, who doesn't really know how or believe that it's possible. And it made all of the difference in the world. I was fortunate enough to go through a uh, four-year school, College of Holy Cross, Massachusetts, was able to um, attend business school at Columbia Graduate School of Business. And it provided a, a platform really for opportunity. And I think that's the big difference. A lot of question about college today, but what it gave me, it's breadth that gave me so many different doors that I could go through. Uh, and I've in fact gone through many of those doors. <laughs> yeah. And one of them uh, led you to, to 7-Eleven and uh, your career there is interesting because you had to deal with so much change so quickly. So you, you have this phrase that I love in the book, Change equals opportunity. I think that's interesting because most of us, when we're hit with change, we go, oh, no. You know, as, a, as an individual, as an investor, we have this attitude that change, is, change isn't going to be good. It's going to be disruptive. It's going to be negative. So how did you embrace change when everything was shifting at 7-Eleven? Exactly. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I, I woke up one day and said, you know, change equals opportunity. In fact, it was in the course of writing the book. And I said, well, that, that acronym CEO is really the job of every CEO, you know? Um, so it's a, it was a wonderful fit. And, and it also made me realize that growing up, I faced a lot of adversity. You know, we all do families are, you know, a mess and broken homes and, you know, poverty, all kinds of challenges as a kid. And I realized that, you know, those things that I had to deal with actually made me stronger and made me more able to deal with change. So when I got to 7-Eleven, here I thought my career was on a fast trajectory and I was with this fabulous company. They were doing great, New York Stock Exchange Company. And then they did an LBO and in 1987, the market crashed and they had $4 billion of debt at 17%. Oh, <laughs> and then, ouch. Yeah, yeah. What, but, but interestingly, while some people would look at that and say, well, this is devastating. You know, I'm a young guy. I started my career. The company is bankrupt. They're saying it's going to go away. Instead of having my head down, I said, well, what have I got to lose? I'm going to work harder. We'll come out the other side of this. And it turned out that not only did the company come out better for having to have to restructure with a whole new business plan, et cetera, but I came out better as an individual and an employee of the company with far greater opportunity than I had going into that crisis. So it was really a great lesson for me. Change doesn't mean bad. A lot of times we think it. it's really our re a response to change rather than the change itself that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that's so true. I think I, I think that's something we all have to we all have to learn over time. And I'm interested because at 7-Eleven, you learned about this idea of Kaizen from your Japanese business partners. And you've got this story about how this led to a better Slurpee. We all we all we all have affection for the Slurpee. Tell us a little bit about this. Well, I, you know, I was armed with a graduate degree in business and I had all of these skills and I thought I knew, you know, basically how to turn around a company from, you know, classic business training. But then I got to Japan and I, I, I was astounded at the success of my Japanese partners with 7-Eleven. They had completely transformed the business. We were, we were in the United States having trouble selling a quality hot dog and they were selling fresh sushi delivered three times a day to the store, restaurant quality sushi. And, you know, I was shocked at that. And I, and I started to, to really try to understand, learn from them 
what they had done, what were their business principles that helped them be so successful. And it, and it came down to something that I was shocked to learn originated all the way back with Edward Deming, you know, post-World War II, an American that was over there trying to help with reconstruction of the, of the, of the country following World War II. And, and he came up, you know, he presented a, a simple principle, um, called uh, plan do see, or, you know, I, I refer to it as the scientific method. In other words, have a hypothesis, you know, I think this is going to happen. You put an action in place and then you step back and measure it. And then you modify the, the action to based on the results, based on the data. This is so ridiculously simple, but they took that principle to the nth degree incorporated into all their virtually all of their business decisions and created as a result a far better business model um, that came right down to individual products they would take every individual product have a hypothesis for how to make it better put an action in place put it in front of the customer measure the results and then come back and reinvent it you know the whole kaizen concept of continuous improvement they were actually putting in place and so i learned a lot uh, from them about that. And I've tried to incorporate it into every business that I've had since. Interesting. Yeah. I wish, I wish we got sushi here at the Seven Eleven. It would be awesome. Someday, someday, so, someday. I hope so. Well, and another thing with, with Seven Eleven that you talk about in the book, which is the diversity of Seven Eleven franchisees, you know, it's, it's been the butt of jokes sometimes, but you also talk about how it's the source really of the brand strength. So you, you sort of, you really, got into learning about those franchisees and what this, what owning a 7-Eleven franchise meant to them. So what lessons did you learn from those franchisees? I did. It was fascinating. It, it, it actually occurred post 9-11 when, you know, we started having some problems at 7-Eleven because people saw us as majority minority and, and they saw the people behind the counter and they started taking out their aggression uh, on right after 9-11 uh, with our stores. And so we I tried to understand and began to talk with franchisees about why did you decide on 7-Eleven? And I discovered that what they were practicing is the American dream. I mean, they would come here with 500 bucks in a, in a suitcase and then they would work in a store, save up enough money to buy a franchise and then turn that into opportunity, bring relatives and put them to work. And, and I, I began to realize that this is really the strength of 7-Eleven. We ended up with 135 different countries represented. And it taught me a lesson about diversity. And in the book, I don't use the word diversity because it's been such a polarizing word lately. You know, it's getting attacked from all directions. And, you know, really what it comes down to and my learning from my 7-Eleven franchisees is it's really cultural literacy. It's, it's understanding other cultures and recognizing that, you know, I have more to learn from them. And if I collect the learnings from all of these different cultures that I have exposure to, I'm going to be a patchwork quilt of their strengths. And it's going to make me a better person overall. And so I've re kind of purposed the idea of diversity into what I call cultural literacy in the book and encourage everybody to pursue that. And it was the really the lesson that I learned from my own 7-Eleven franchisees. I love that. Well, let's move on, talk a little bit about Blockbuster, because you had this, you had this very successful 21-year career at 7-Eleven. You come into Blockbuster as CEO uh, at this critical time. What do you think people get wrong about the stories that we tell now about Blockbuster and what really happened? Well, unfortunately, like everything else, people are looking for the simple answer. So the simple answer is, well, Netflix must have beat Blockbuster and Blockbuster didn't keep up with technology. Um, there is far more learning in the Blockbuster story if people would dig in and, and understand it a little bit better. Because really what happened was not Blockbuster's failure to keep up with technology. In fact, people don't even know this, but Blockbuster partnered with Enron in the early 2000, like 2004 or something, to try to come up with the first streaming video capability. That was way too early. Um, there's a rumor that Netflix tried to offer themselves to Blockbuster. That was in the year 2000. That was before streaming was even a thing or even on anyone's radar screen. And so the 
really what ultimately happened was Blockbuster spun out of Viacom as an IPO. Uh, Viacom used to own the company. They spun them out in the year 2004 with a billion dollars of debt on the balance sheet. No problem. Blockbuster was a cash, cash flow machine, could handle that debt, and they were going on down the road. When I arrived in 2007, first thing I did was to buy a streaming video company called MovieLink. So we were well positioned. We had new releases. MovieLink had 3,000 digitized movies, the largest uh, assortment of anybody in the industry at the time. And we renamed that product, Blockbuster On Demand, very well positioned to compete. We doubled EBITDA, earnings before interest tax depreciation, et cetera. And we tripled net in our earnings release for the third quarter of 2008. So you might say, well, what happened? <laughs> you know, yeah. you were perfectly well positioned. Well, if you remember what happened in September of 2008, Lehman Brothers collapsed. The banking industry basically was on edge and virtually all lending was shut down. Well, a third of our debt was due in the year 2009. That is the story of Blockbuster that we were unable to refinance that debt at a reasonable interest rate. We were forced uh, ultimately into a restructuring of the company and we sold the company to a strategic partner, Dish Networks. That's that's fascinating about the part with, um, with, with being ahead of the game with streaming because I think that happens so often. We see it over and over with products that come out before the audience is is ready and, you know, that's, it's, I, I'm wondering what's going to happen with, with things like, you know, uh, like Apple's Vision Pro. Is this the right time for it? Is it too early? We don't know. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and, and that's the unique thing about technology uh, and about embracing change. I mean, you, you have to see it coming. You do have to embrace it. But the timing is critical. And, um, it, and really, it wasn't that we were too early as much as it was you know, because we were well positioned, we knew we were early. Kids were still basically streaming on their Xbox. TVs weren't smart yet. Uh, the iPad, for frame of reference, the iPad didn't launch until 2009. So this was very, very early in the game. But it was really the cash flow. And the lesson here for all businesses is that, you know, remember the old expression, cash is king. We're particularly in a time of crisis. And there's a lesson right now. Because if I go back in my history, all the way back to 1987, when I joined 7-Eleven, they ran into the, the financial market collapse of 1987 and had to restructure the company. Then again, I experienced it in 2008 when we went, when, in, when, when, when interest rates went from 5 or 6% all the way up to 12 for challenged companies or more. Here we are in that same environment today where companies may have borrowed at two or three percent a few years ago and now all of a sudden they're having to pay seven or eight percent so the lesson is there from the past if you're careful about cash management you can weather the storm but that debt can be a killer and cause a company to you know have to step back and restructure yeah yeah absolutely and uh, so you were the CEO of two big companies and certainly with, with Blockbuster, uh, not, not an easy time. You, you talk about in the book about the, kind of being tried in the media in relation to the things that the Blockbuster was doing. Uh, some of that was clearly out of your control. But as a CEO, when, when you're facing that heat, what are some of the, the challenges of kind of tuning out everyone saying, what are you doing and staying focused on what you need to do? Yeah, I had a, a, an interesting experience. I had a, started getting calls from my buddies in New York because uh, I didn't uh, take the New York Post living in Dallas, Texas, but the New York <laughs> New York Post printed a half-page color picture of me with a Pinocchio nose because oh. you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> was not it was not a pretty sight. And and the reason they did it is that they had been challenging me about this, you know, balance sheet and we were going to be able to refinance our debt. Blockbuster had such a cash flow advantage that I really didn't anticipate filing for uh, Chapter 11 for restructuring. Well, we put out a 10K and we gave the warning that that could happen. And certainly when Moody's gave us an increase in our debt rating but declared us a potential uh, default risk, 
the New York Post went crazy with it and said, you know, uh, block busted was the headline, I believe. But, <laughs> I know it was brutal. It was brutal. But the learning from that, really, and from all of the, you know, false information about Blockbuster, and, you know, people assuming that Netflix crushed the company, et cetera, et cetera, you realize it's not personal, it's business. And it's such an important learning because confidence is critically important for a leader in any environment that they can't take these things personally. It's going to happen. And you're going to get attacked from all sides at times. But if you know you're doing the right thing, if you have the confidence to continue leading and doing the right thing, then you can recognize this isn't personal, it's just business. And you know sometimes there are motives that people have behind these attacks that they're making. And, and you recognize that and you move on. Absolutely. Well, I want to move on to talk a little bit about, about the book and about some of the lessons in education, because you talk a bit about institutional learning, some of the ways you tried to implement it when you were at Blockbuster and 7-Eleven. And you make this important point about outbound clarity, which is saying what you want to say and inbound clarity, people being able to listen. And I thought it was interesting because you talk about the CEO as being being the educator. And what you just talked about is interesting because you have to educate, you know, the shareholders, you have to educate the public, but you also have to educate the the internal stakeholders and that education may not be the same so it's it's being an educator as a CEO sounds like quite a challenge it is you know and it, and it's it's a really important theme of the book because education is freedom it really means much more than just you should go to school it means you know even if you graduate from college or graduate school you basically then have a license to learn i compare it to when i was a uh, uh, learning to fly you get a pilot's license, you think, I'm a pilot. No, you have a license to learn. And then you have, have to go build the experience to continue learning. And it's a lifelong learning process. And so in business, um, I, I really boil it down to three things. I've already mentioned the importance of change. I mentioned the, the critical importance of confidence. But clarity, as you mentioned, really is one of the hardest, ironically, um, because Einstein used to say, actually, that the hardest thing in the world is to take something that's complex and make it simple. But if you don't, then you either won't understand it. And that's the listening part. You have to be able to simplify or you won't be able to teach it or have people execute it if they don't understand it. So that issue of clarity in both outbound communications and inbound communications, both speaking and listening, is so critically important. Um, because people really need to understand what it is you're trying to lead them to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you mentioned earlier uh, some of the, the conversation that's happening right now with college, you know, uh, rising student loans, uh, you know, changing world of AI. A lot of people are questioning the value of a college education. What do you, what do you think about some of that, that conversation that's happening right now? You know, frankly, I'm worried about it because there is this narrative that, oh, it's not necessary. And, you know, and I'm thrilled that technology is there, that you can learn so much via YouTube or, or Khan Academy or whatever. But I see those things today anyway as supplemental. Now, in the future, I think technology is going to completely transform the way we learn and the way we um, teach. But today, I really encourage people to think about the practical reality that a formalized education is the only measurement tool we have. So that if you're a corporation and you have 30 candidates for a job, it's pretty hard to tell who's who and what's what just on the basis of experience. But when you do look at that education, you know that they have the breadth of learning, that they can not just have the skill needed for that job, but they have breadth of, you know, even a liberal arts education that gives them the ability to read and write and to think and to interact with others. So it's critically important. Uh, the way I characterize it is, you know, just like a product has a brand and, and, a, and, a, and a business has a brand. Well, we individually have a brand and it is the best way to differentiate ourselves is to take advantage of as much education as we get and to make that part of our brand that makes others have more confidence uh, in who we are and what we can do. 
Well, you just said liberal arts. Liberal arts has been taking it on on the chin, really. Uh, you know, uh, the departments are shrinking. There's a lot of question of whether or not a liberal arts education is even valuable anymore. So what do you think about that? It is. And, it, you know, that's I, I think it is critically important for us to have the breadth of learning that a liberal arts education provides. And let's face it. Most of us, when we're in high school, have no clue what we want to do. It's not until we really understand other things. Uh, and, and the most important part of liberal education, liberal arts education, is the ability uh, to, to think and to reason and to have exposure to other learning. So that even though it's under fire right now, that breadth of learning gives us optionality. And I think that's the most important message to take away, that what education provides is optionality. It opens doors. As I said, you know, I thought I was going to be a lawyer. Heaven forbid, I would have been a terrible lawyer. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> no, I think I would have uh, because I'm way too ADD to have, you know, have gotten down deep into contracts. And e even if I was good at it, I would have been miserable, very unhappy. I ended up liking the challenges of business, but I could not have had the opportunity to pivot from law to business without the breadth of education that I had behind me. And, you know, and that same rule applies. Would you rather just be a, uh, I shouldn't say just be, but any of the vocations, would you rather be a plumber or would you rather have the breadth of education that allows you to be a plumber if you really like doing those things and being a plumber? But if you've got the breadth of education behind you, perhaps you'll build a plumbing business and, 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 and own a plumbing, plumbing company, which may give you the optionality to do so much more and the end of the day, I have more freedom. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that lately because there has been a renewed interest in in uh, in technical colleges, in vocational training, and certainly we need more plumbers. We, I mean, the the age of plumbers keeps going up. We need more construction workers. But there's an it, you've made a really interesting point there about adding in other types of education to maybe a more strict technical clerk curriculum. Absolutely. You know, I'll give you a great example. I love to fly. I mean, you can see in, in I mean, I, I, <laughs> I do notice the planes above you. Yeah, I have, I have a passion for aviation that I've always had. And, and I have a lot of young people that I try to encourage to fly and I, you know, uh, do as much as I can to promote general aviation. Um, but there's a temptation because you can make 150, $200,000 a year as a pilot there's a huge demand for pilots. It doesn't require a college education. But what I tell the young people is, look, do this, pursue your passion, but still get that degree because it does give you the optionality. You may find at some point in your career that flying that airplane is kind of like driving a bus and it's not as exciting as it used to be. And you'd like to do other things with your life and your career. If you've got that baseline college education, you can then pivot to do something else. And, you know, in the extreme, I tell I tell the young people, you know, I have a lot more fun owning my own airplane and flying it than I would having to fly it for somebody else, you know, or an airline. And that's the power of education to give you that optionality. Still fly, but it's a lot more fun to fly myself around than to have to fly somebody else. <laughs> exactly. Well, the other thing about education is these days is it just never ends. I mean, I, I think it's I think it's a shift that's been sort of hard for people who who are older to, to understand. It's like there's not the idea of a, a terminal degree. It doesn't necessarily exist anymore. We just keep going. So we're constantly adding these new certifications. As you've studied education, what what have you noticed? Well, you're right. And I, I think the big opportunity right now is technology is opening up so much more opportunity for lifelong learning, not just not just college or undergraduate, lifelong learning. So, I mean, I, I, I as you can probably tell, I'm curious by nature. I've got a whole chapter on curiosity. But, um, you know, I'm a frustrated musician and I play a little piano, a little guitar. If I want to go play the violin, I can pull it up on YouTube buy a cheap violin and I can start playing and I can actually learn virtually anything I want to learn via technology today. And so part of the book is, 
encouraging people that lifelong learning is different from it used to be because if you want to learn a language using Duolingo or Babel, it's so much easier today. And if you travel to, to Europe and you want to learn French, you can learn enough to actually have a far better experience in France than you would otherwise just as a tourist. So lifelong learning is something that I think will keep, I know it keeps me young, um, but I hope it keeps others young and, and, and keeps us curious and excited about life. Well, it sort of circled back to that idea of em- embracing change rather than r- rather than fearing, oh, no, I have to get another certification. It's like, oh, you get this opportunity to learn something new. Exactly. Exactly. And you said the magic word. You know what it is? Fear. In fact, a big, big theme of the book is that, you know, we're all scared. You know, what are we afraid of? You turn on the news and it's like, oh, they're going to take this from you. They're going to take that from you. They're going to do this to you. You know, everybody's so f- afraid. But that fear is a killer and it, and, it, and it inhibits people. It keeps them from fulfilling their opportunity, their, their own pra- passions, et cetera. And it, you know, ultimately, the example I give in the book is that when you're scared as a little kid, you turn on the light or mom turns on the light and you realize there's not a monster under the bed and that fear goes away, right? That's what knowledge is. Knowledge takes away fear. So have the courage to learn and you'll find that that fear goes away and it opens up so much more opportunity when you're not afraid anymore. Well, I want to get your take on on AI because I've been talking to people about it for a while. And one of the things that I've heard from younger people is that, you know, traditional education isn't necessarily working for them anymore, partly because they're like, why do I have to stuff my brain with all of this stuff if the computer can do it faster and better? So how are you sort of thinking about AI and how it relates to traditional education? I, I am super excited about AI. I, I'm, as you can tell, I'm excited about technology in general. Um, when Starlink lights up entire continents like Africa um, and enables technology to provide learning in places that we could never even get books to historically, I mean, the, the opportunity is amazing. And you look at AI, and again, there's a lot of fear and probably natural we should be cautious about these new technologies, but think about the good that AI can do. So we have taught in school the same way for a hundred years, blackboards, books, right? Teacher standing in front of the class, standardized test, bell curve. And a lot of people that doesn't fit. And, and, uh, with AI, we have the opportunity to tailor, literally curate that lesson to the way somebody learns. So some of, some of us learn better with videos. We can curate that training to have them watch videos. And others respond better to the written word. Others to, you know, uh, a teacher or a professor. We can find the best algebra professor in the world and pipe them into the classroom. So the teacher then becomes almost a concierge to let someone who really knows how to teach, teach. And then we measure the performance of the students and the best way they learn based on their results. And we can keep modifying and keep improving. So think about, this is not artificial intelligence. This is maximizing human intelligence. It's doing the same thing. It's not machine learning, it's human learning and improving human learning over and over and over again by using the technology to enable it. Yeah, but one of the things I worry about with technology though is you know, we've seen since the pandemic, uh, students have done worse because 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 of remote learning. So what do you think about how we still bring in that human connection so that people are still taking in the information? Yeah, I'm again, I'm not worried about it because I did a lot of work on digital uh, learning during the pandemic. And I was excited about it because we moved forward tw- as, as much as 20 years in providing access to digital learning just by lighting up cities with Wi-Fi capabilities and hotspots and giving kids laptops, et cetera. What we are in this in the early stages, it's almost like the early stages of digital streaming, right? It was a horrible experience. And everybody said, oh, this is never going to work, right? Not true. Technology will, over time, integrate the platforms, make them better. Here's some examples. Um, LinkedIn learning, it's a wonderful thing, but it basically takes textbooks and turns them into video digital. Well, with 
the next generation, you'll be able to, instead of showing a biology class, you'll be able to take somebody into an operating room and watch a live, you know, operation going on. That's a whole different level of learning. The best example I can give you is all the kids that hated digital learning would put away their homework and then play video games for eight hours. Right? Why? It was engaging and the the, the, the graphics were eye popping. Another really important difference. They had incentives. So why not provide incentives? In fact, I'm working on a, a, a thing I call micro finance. Uh, it's like microfinance, but micro scholarships. So instead of giving kids scholarships at the end, we should be working on incentivizing them up front. Um, I've encouraged friends and friends' children to use Khan Academy to learn math. But Khan Academy is a little dull. What if you got, every time you pass the test, you get 20 cents for it by American Airlines because they want people to learn math and science. Then you might have the incentive and have more fun doing it and staying in and engaged in those programs. So again, it's, it's early. The technology is going to bring these things that improve engagement. So I am super confident that we're going to find education is transformed in the same way that we've transformed retail with Amazon or automobiles with Tesla. We're going to find when education works its magic on teaching and learning, it's phenomenal what can occur. Well, the book is Education is Freedom. Jim Keyes, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. As always, I enjoyed being with you.